afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the 15th, 16th lecture of the Logical Reasoning in Human Genetics course, um, a partnership between Columbia Global Center Tunis and Institut Pasteur Tunis. Um, today's topic is Alzheimer's, the most common form of dementia, a disease that keeps endangering the lives of humans, but also a disease that humans continue to battle via, via different means, most notably research. It is therefore a great pleasure to welcome Professor Joseph Lee, who will be introduced shortly by Professor Joseph Terwilliger. Both of them are from Columbia University. Um, Joseph Lee studies genetics, genetic epidemiology of Alzheimer's disease and other age-related diseases in several unique high-risk populations in different parts of the world. Um, we'll hear more from him later. I'm also very happy to welcome Professor Riyad Guider, head of the neurology department at the Razi Institute of Tunisia, corresponding member of the French Academy of Medicine and of several international academies and institutes. Uh, we also have with us members of the um, steering committee of the logical reasoning in human genetics, um, notably professors Sonia Abdelhat uh, from Institut Pasteur, um, as well as Professor Harald Goring from South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute. Um, we also have with us uh, today as speakers, Professor Ahlem Ashur from Hôpital Charles Nicole, as well as Dr. Uh, Professor Amina Nasri from the School of Medicine of Tunis. So we have a long list of speakers today, but uh, I will first of all leave, um, give the floor to Joseph Terwilliger. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'll keep this very brief, but. Um... Dr. Uh, Joseph Lee's been a colleague and collaborator of mine for about 35 years now. We went to school together and we were neighbors in the dorm, so we got to know each other and started working together. We've been traveling and working together on most of the continents, you know, South America, um, Asia. We worked together in Kazakhstan and Korea and in Europe and looking forward to actually going in person to uh, Tunisia in the near future. I visited in 2020, January, and had the chance to start trying to build these collaborations. And then COVID came and threw a monkey wrench in the pipeline. But this is, for now, Joe is going to introduce some of his work on Alzheimer's disease with the hope of finding, again, new ways that we can work together in person and in the real world going forward in the future. So I'll turn it over to Professor Joe Lee from Columbia University. Okay, uh, let's see, let me share my screen here. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Yes, perfect. If you could, yeah, fine. Okay, now you, is it uh, screen mode? No, no. On, on lecture mode, so please no, we'll, yeah. put it Sorry. on the program. Put it on a full screen if you can. Uh, I, th I think I am, no? We only uh, see the view that you see. So we see your slide and then the list of slides to come. So you shared the wrong screen. So unshare and then reshare the slideshow screen. And pick the right the right screen. Yeah. Is it perfect. Uh, perfect? Perfect. Okay. All right. So, uh, to the, I was asked to talk uh, talk about uh, what I actually do. Uh, using extreme samples. So it's going to be uh, a bit eclectic. Uh, but anyway, let me just get going. So I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease as an example. And I expect uh, many of you are not uh, used to uh, listening to uh, Alzheimer's talks. So I'm going to give a brief background. So Alzheimer's disease is a uh, uh, neurological disease that involves memory loss and language loss and orientation and, and various other activities that are going to be problematic. And this picture shows 
as an artist uh, go through his uh, uh, dementia uh, over eight years. And this is a self portrait of himself. And as you can see every year and a half or so, you can see the deterioration in his cognitive ability. And this is exactly what uh, 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 patients with Alzheimer's disease experience. And I always use this just to give a sense of what people uh, uh, is experiencing. And when you talk about Alzheimer's disease, it's always uh, the first thing that people talk about is plaques and tangles. And plaques are uh, generated by amyloids and essentially it kills neurons. And the tangles are uh, also generated. And when you have sufficient amount of plaques and tangles in the brain, and what happens is that uh, uh, there is a change in metabolism in the uh, brain. So the glucose utilization alters. And then when sufficient amount of that goes on for a while, then what happens is that your, your neurons die and your brains shrink, as you can see on the right side of that. Uh, brain that you see on the screen. So, but it is important to realize that uh, the, the neuropathological process happens long before uh, you see a signs of uh, clinical symptoms. So when the study on autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease uh, consortium looked at parents of the people who uh, have Alzheimer's disease and have a PS1 or a P PS2 or a PP mutation, they recognized that some 20 years prior to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, they begin to see changes in uh, uh, biological markers in the brain. So that's, uh, they have measured the, the CSF, uh, spinal cord fluid, as well as blood plasma. And, and you can see that things changes uh, slowly over time, uh, including A beta and tau and so forth. So that makes it really hard to study what causes and how and when. So, so far we know that Alzheimer's disease involved amyloid beta and the uh, tau. And as you can see, there are other mechanisms by which these things happen. Sometimes excess lipids uh, occurs and there is a cholesterol trafficking from inside the neurons to outside. And, and there are all sorts of other things that are being uh, discovered as now that uh, neuroinflammation is the hottest thing now, as you can see on the right side of the, the figure. So, but as you can imagine, there is, when we are trying to figure out genotype-phenotype relationship, there are some uh, difficulties. So uh, as I pointed out uh, earlier in my uh, talk some time ago, uh, uh, what, what Alzheimer's uh, community has done is that they collected all the GUSs that anybody and everybody has done, which is tend to be a uh, 95% uh, European uh, Caucasian population in the Europe and, and the United States. And when we, and then they identified 85, 83 SNFs uh, from meta-analysis of GWAS that essentially predicts somebody's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So we took this uh, 83 SNFs and applied to one of uh, the cohort that I study, which is healthy aging cohort, where uh, there are multiple people in the family who live to 100 years without disease. So these are cohorts of healthy aging, uh, familial healthy aging. When we apply those 83 SNFs as a, a, a polygenic risk score, uh, that, which is quite popular nowadays in genomics field, when we apply to uh, our cohort in healthy aging, what we found was that out of 83, only four was found to be significantly different uh, between the cases and controls, those who develop AD and otherwise. And then when we use all 83 uh, SNP marker as a, a predictor of AD risk, 
as you can see on the graph on the right, there is no difference in the PRS scores between those who become demented and those who do not. So as you can see that based on sampling, you'll see that the, the, the predictor that you, you see in the general population not, may not be applicable to you. So the reason I bring this up is that when you, when you have your own study that is non-European based uh, uh, population, the risk calculation in your own population may not be the same and, and you need to take into, that into account. And the second sample that I like to show is that this is a paper uh, written by a, a Korean scientist who have joined the ADNI, which is one of the largest imaging consortium in Alzheimer's disease. And then they measured, uh, PET, use PET scan to measure amyloid beta. And they show that as you can see on the graph on the right side, when you look at the Caucasian population in red bar, you see that their amyloid beta goes up with age uh, uh, in a linear manner. Whereas the slope for the Korean population in blue are substantially lower than those uh, you see in the European population. So that depending on what population you're studying, things, the standard that you are gonna use as a cut point for your diagnostic criteria will be substantially different. So that if you are thinking about doing a study in North Africa or anywhere else, you have to take into account the difference in different populations. So uh, I'm gonna start off with a genetic association uh, because that's, as a genetic epidemiology uh, uh, person, this is my starting point. And, and I'm gonna use a couple of uh, samples as an example. So what is our sci main scientific question in, in our study? Uh, okay, so the, the question that we ask is everybody else around the world trying to, tries to find the gene that causes Alzheimer's disease and the approach that we have taken is because I, I am, uh, because we have a extremely high risk population or low risk population, we ask, well, why did some of these uh, high risk population escape? How did they escape Alzheimer's disease into their old age? And then if they have a high frequency of protective variants, we reason that those people, centenarian healthy aging cohort, the frequency of those uh, variant may be higher and the effect size stronger. So then to answer those questions, we use three cohorts. The uh, founder mutation carriers in Puerto Rico of a PS1 mutation, which causes Alzheimer's disease. And then we also have a cohort of adults with Down syndrome who have three copies of APP gene, which also causes Alzheimer's disease. And then we follow uh, uh, about 450 families where multiple people in the family live to 100 years old. And they tend to have a very low prevalence of chronic diseases. So we see the two high risk population uh, on the right. And then whatever we find by variants that uh, uh, appear to modulate the effect of uh, PS1 or APP, we look to see what happens in the APP. Or sometimes we look at uh, low risk population and check to see how it behaves in the high risk population. So I've already uh, talked about this, but I'm gonna review it anyway. So the mean age of a PS1 mutation varies quite a bit depending on which variant you have, some variants have mid average onset of 30s and others have average onset of 60s, as you can see in the graph. And, and once you have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, some people live a few years after, depending on the mutation that you have in this graph, or sometimes live more than 20 years, as you can see on the right. So, even though people who have PS, carry PS1 mutation, even though they have autosomal dominant form, the, uh, uh, the severity of 
their clinical outcome varies substantially. So, and, and this is just one example showing that uh, uh, when we study uh, uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, even though people from Latin America, Colombians and Venezuelans, their genetic makeups differ as, as a result, the allele frequencies differ. And then, and consequence of this is that when we found the genetic modifier, the effect, depending on what the background, genetic background is, we see the substantially different uh, phenotypic expression of those genetic modifiers depending on the population we're studying. So this is the uh, first report of our mutation that that uh, Richard Mayhew's group uh, discovered in 2001, and then uh, we follow it up and start collecting recruiting and families with the founder mutation in Puerto Rico. As you can see, at uh, lower right hand, that if, uh, a PS1G206A mutation uh, make about half as much uh, amyloid beta as Swish APP variant that is, uh, has been studied quite substantially. And then as you can see in this uh, pedigree uh, graph, each dot represents a family. And then within a family, even though they all have the same mutation, the, the phenotypic variability in age at onset varies substantially where the, the families in the left side, they have it all under uh, in their third uh, 40s, whereas the families on the right, they all have uh, uh, on onset of Alzheimer's disease after 60. And then from using those cohorts, we had a we performed the linkage analysis to identify candidate genes, and and these were the candidate genes we discovered from the early onset families. As you can see, we found primarily in two Q thirteen and four Q thirty five there were several genes, and then once we found this uh, genetic modifiers, because these families have PS one mutation already, uh, we looked to see how. SH3, RF3, NPH, P1, and, and these genes modify the, the levels of uh, pathological uh, uh, biomarkers that are present in the people with uh, a PS1 mutation. And then whether we then ask these modifiers, do they have any effect on the non-PS1 carriers? And to do that, we looked at the late onset Alzheimer's disease and, and we see that the genetic modifier that we discovered in the early onset uh, also show uh, consistent effect in the late onset. And this is a rel relatively important one because uh, this is something that uh, everybody always asks, why do you study early onset? Because it's such a small proportion of late onset Alzheimer's disease. However, it shows the generalizability of the, some of the things that we discovered in early onset can be applied to late onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and this is something you ought to remember because uh, when you study populations in North Africa, uh, then you will say, well, uh, these uh, populations have special features. What is it good for? It, as you can see that Sometimes, most of the times, it's uh, generalizable to the other population in some ways. So while the while this uh, is going on, uh, so once we identify these uh, genetic variants, we uh, tell our cell biologist colleagues, "Can you look at what is the mechanism by which these?" Uh, 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 genetic modifiers are affecting the uh, neurodegenerative disease process in, in these individuals with a PS1 mutation who have also uh, uh, secondary modifier factors. And then while we're doing that, we have created uh, uh, iPSC cell lines uh, for the PS1 study and then Down syndrome study, and then they while we're working on the genetic association part, my cell biologist colleagues are creating iPSC cell lines that are two-dimensional as well as three-dimensional organoids. So that by testing on these 
three-dimensional organoids, which you know some people like to call it mini brain, and, and we try to see how these uh, variants behave. And as you can see, and then these are the, the uh, uh, standard protein biomarkers, uh, amyloid beta, uh, p tau, and, and uh, APP, and we're trying to see how they behave in the organoids uh, of the people who we are studying. And then when, and then they go through these, look at these organoids and, and try to see what kind of uh, uh, cellular uh, development is occurring in those uh, iPSC cell lines. And, and, and as you can see that, you see that gliosis is happening in some of these cell lines. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna discuss more of this later. And then we also have Down syndrome and then, and then neuro uh, Down syndrome, they all come up with the three copies of APP gene. And because they have 50% extra uh, chromosome 21, they have excess amyloid beta from birth. So then can, and because uh, the, the medical system has improved uh, the health of most people, the people who with the Down syndrome, who used to uh, have a life expectancy of about 10 years, uh, of about 40 years ago now, uh, have expectation, uh, life expectancy uh, that is four times greater. So a lot of people with Down syndrome live beyond 60s. And, and consequence of that is that uh, when you ha have uh, three copies of APP and live beyond 40, uh, then your brain show all the neuropathologies of Alzheimer's disease uh, as early as uh, mid 40s. And then, and they, their pattern of cumulative incidence of disease uh, mirror uh, those in the general population, as you can see on the right. And you can say that you can see that everything is about shifted about 25 years to the left of the curve. So things happen about 25 years earlier uh, when you have a Down syndrome uh, population. So, and, and from North African point of view, the population of Down syndrome may be currently pediatric in nature so that only pediatricians take care of people with Down syndrome. But 20 or 30 years from now, those people will survive beyond the pediatric age and will be experiencing gerontological disorders. And it would not be a bad idea to study them carefully now. And, and, and when you look at these people who follow Down syndrome, you will see that some people uh, have, their trajectory of memory decline is extremely slow so that uh, this Mr. C that I point out lived to age 81 without memory impairment. And this is uh, sort of, uh, I, he's sort of like a poster uh, a child of uh, Down syndrome, a healthy aging uh, person. Uh, so, and, 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 and then the second sample that I like to point out is that this person in uh, my collaborator, Guy Prusher, identified this patient that he took care of uh, for many years, had a APP gene on chromosome 21 knocked out uh, by nature so that when she died, uh, she had a perfectly normal cognitive uh, performance given her Down syndrome status. But as you can see that her brain showed no neuropathology of Down syndrome. This strongly supports that APP is the, the definitely necessary factor in order to have Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, we don't know anything about Tangle effect in this sample because uh, the sample was... Uh, uh, thrown away by the biobank uh, that kept that. So here I'm going to give uh, one example uh, showing how we're using multiomic data that generate from these extreme samples uh, of PS1 and Down syndrome and centenarians and how we uh, uh, look at uh, one across the other to see which genes may alter the uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. 
So as I told you that plaques and tangles are primary drivers of Alzheimer's disease, but nowadays uh, all these new factors are coming up. So that, as you can see on the right, uh, upper right, you see that lipids are playing a role in disease process uh, and neuroinflammation is quite important. And also uh, cellular exporting of uh, gunk that's occurring in the neuron out to the external cellular space is important of uh, how the clearance of uh, amyloid is gonna uh, ameliorate the effect of uh, these uh, bad proteins on the neurons. So we decided to study lipids here in, in Alzheimer's disease by looking at uh, a healthy centenarian cohort. And, and the lipids are important because it alters amyloid processing and it's involved, APOE4 is involved in intracellular trafficking. And also we previously have uh, identified some lipids to be differentially uh, present in AD versus non-AD. So this is how we do things. Uh, we start with a genetic association. I don't know whether you can see my pointer or not. Uh, and, then, and then we look at the transcriptomic data to see whether there is a variation in gene expression. And we make, measure the protein level as well as metabolite levels and measure their risk of Alzheimer's disease. And because our lipidomic uh, experiment generated 188 lipids and then trying to figure out 180, which one of those 188 lipids are associated with Alzheimer's disease, what we first did is was because we are interested in genetic causes. First, we limited all the lipids that are highly heritable and that are at the same time associated with Alzheimer's disease. And then if you have a highly heritable lipids that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, which genes are associated with those lipids? So we looked at this process in two steps. And then lastly, if they're associated with uh, lipids that are also causing Alzheimer's disease, is it differentially expressed? Uh, and because we only had blood sample transcriptomic data, that's what we did. We looked at transcriptomic data of uh, uh, blood uh, from the blood-based biomarker. And as you can see, we tested all 188 lipids and we found that there were about 10 lipids that were predictive of AD. And then these are the 10, 10 lipids that causes Alzheimer's disease. And then we look to see, it turns out that there are three class of lipids uh, that are associated with Alzheimer's disease and, and genetic association were limited to those three loci, 4P, 11Q, and 15Q. And then we did genome scanning. And then, and then I'm just gonna show you one example for phospho, phosphatidylethanolamine uh, was one of the lipids that were, came out significant and it was localized to uh, 15Q21.3 in our centenarian study. And then uh, because we had a same uh, lipid data in Down syndrome, we looked to see what happens in, in Down syndrome. And then we show the signal in the same uh, locus that we observed in the centenarian study. And, and then uh, uh, my analyst, look further to see if there are any other uh, publications that showed uh, a signal uh, on 15Q21.3. And, and she found that there was a genetic uh, association study that was reported uh, by a, a group on car coronary artery disease, suggesting that there may be a gene that makes extra lipid which may lead to eventually a coronary artery disease. But in this case, it's affecting uh, our Alzheimer's disease risk, and it may relate to a vascular uh, uh, dementia of some sort. 
So as you can see that we found three loci and, 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 and those are the possible candidate genes. And then the blue marker says, how comparable are these two PS1 carriers? And then the last question that we ask is that if there are uh, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, it should be affecting neuronal cells. But we tested, uh, we did not test it on brain tissues. How do we interpret this finding? So then we compare, does Down syndrome results uh, mirror what we see in autosomal dominant form? So this in one of the consortium studies that I'm involved in, they looked at how Down syndrome and Down syndrome sibling and the familial Alzheimer's disease compare. And, and you can see that the mid, middle panel is the Down syndrome and the far right panel represents the familial AD and the sibling controls are all the way up to the left. And then you can see that familial Alzheimer's disease because they include many different forms of PS1 mutation and APP mutation, you see the, the strong variability on the right side. But what was struck me was that the sibling controls and, and, and the Down syndrome asymptomatic cases on the two left column show that they are very similar. And, and despite the fact that the siblings who are unaffected have 50% uh, more because they have three chromosomes, level of amyloid beta based on PET scan measure is comparable. And then we develop iPSC cell lines of AD of Down syndrome. Uh, and, and this involves three other labs, uh, Barbara Cornea of Stem Cell Lab at Columbia, Andrew Sproul and uh, Catherine Marquier. Are, these are two cell biologists who work, uh, collaborate with me on our uh, uh, cell biology experiments from either Down syndrome or PS1. And, and these are the Down syndrome cases that we have generated iPSC cell lines. And, and, and then, uh, so as we do these experiments, uh, it's ideal that iPSC modeling gives us an opportunity to look at genetic contributions to Alzheimer's disease in the, the, the samples that we actually are studying Alzheimer's disease for. So it's a valuable set of uh, data to have. And then, but when we develop iPSC cell lines, we have to differ, we have to remember that when we reprogram the cell from the blood cell to neurons, to glia, microglia or something else, we have to remember that at first we're talking undifferentiated cell. It's almost like embryonic. And then 30 days later, we see how it changes and then we, changed uh, how things change in 95 days. But these are all great. However, you have to remember that these are neurodevelopmental cells, not neurodegenerative cells. So what we find in neurodevelopment, how applicable is this to neurodegeneration? So all these things come up. And as we do more experiments, we're learning more and more, but more and more questions arise. So this is to show uh, uh, how we are doing uh, PB, uh, iPSC from uh, our stem cell lab. And, and we're taking PBMC blood cells and then converting them to uh, neurons. Okay, so. So we have done uh, iPSC cells uh, comparison in three models. Uh, what we have done is we have compared the Down syndrome that develops into AD compared to the sibling controls. And then we also compare Down syndrome, Alzheimer's disease with Alzheimer's disease and without Alzheimer's disease. So each of these comparisons give you allows you opportunity to think about genes that are involved in neurodegeneration or trisomy when we compare DSAD versus disomy. When we compare DSAD versus known AD, we're talking about genes involved in neurodegeneration. When we compare DSAD 
no AD and disomy, then we're talking about trisomy effect. So there are a number of different ways we can manipulate this comparisons to see how genes are differentially expressed and then how that affects the whole disease process. And this is one experiment that uh, we did uh, comparing the transcriptomic data of the three groups. As you can see on the far left, the, the three group at an undifferentiated stage, they cluster together in PCA. But as you develop into 30 days and 90 days, you see that the, the sample that was originally reprogrammed from DSAD, Alzheimer's cases, are separating out compared to the non-DSAD. So that there is something involved in transcriptomic things that are different in the, the uh, uh, neurodegenerative processes. So, and then we follow the same to see how they affect clinically and we see different pattern as well. And then we went through and, and did a whole set of genes to see how they cluster. And then these are the comparisons that we made. I'm not gonna go into detail because there's just too much information. We can spend a whole hour on this. Uh, and, then, and then taking these iPSC cell lines, we performed lipidomic analysis and we found that sulfatides were significantly different in the case of DSAD compared to non DS non AD cases and control disomy controls. And as we do these things, the more and more questions arise. Uh, what happens? How do you how do you interpret these things? And, and when you have iPSC cell lines compare, and eventually because Alzheimer's happens in the brain, we want to see how comparable iPSC experiment results are to brain uh, tissue results in whether it be Down syndrome or any PS1 or, or general population. And then we, all, we already show that the DS and the PS1 show some comparability in the results, but PS1, the neurodegenerative process appeared to happen much earlier than Down syndrome. And, and, uh, and we're still working on the organoids, but it's far more complicated and then we're looking at with a Martyrs lab, uh, looking at the functional genomic pipelines. So all these things are happening si simultaneously. And as you can see, uh, I, as a genetic epidemiologist, I'm sort of lost when you talk about cell biology, but I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and, and this is what makes it really cool uh, to do science. And, and I'm sure uh, if you guys are good at uh, it, at what you do and then uh, bring in an uh, interesting population. As I showed you in D. Prosser's case, one case of Down syndrome with a, a knockout APP gene give you incredible biological insight into the whole disease process. So when you have a special population in North Africa and, and, and they can uh, contribute in a unique way that you cannot expect to find in the large scale uh, genome-wise screening of uh, uh, European populations. So I, I strongly uh, recommend that you guys uh, look into uh, ways to optimize how your population can bring uh, to a table insight that is not possible to do in uh, uh, US and European population. So as you can see uh, here, uh, this is collaborative effort. Uh, my lab is on upper la left and they do uh, all the work on, on data that are generated by massive uh, group of people. And Cordia's lab does the stem cell, Sproul lab does the, the uh, cell biology and Mark Thierry's lab does functional genetics. And, and of course, Mayu's lab, uh, who is, who's, uh, uh, started a whole Caribbean Hispanic study and then my collaborator in University of Puerto Rico and uh, the other consortium studies are being offered there. And if you see upper right hand, those are the gen, uh, databases that are uh, available to the general population so that uh, you can, uh, sitting in North Africa, download all the data being generated by uh, 
US and US scientists, and then you can look at the data and compare and contrast those data to your own data to see how things happen. And, and at the bottom left, right, are the, the fundings that made all this possible. Uh, and that's it, folks. Uh, my goal was to spend 45 minutes, and I think I did reasonably uh, so. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I'm very, very impressed. I wanted to thank you uh, by this presentation because it was a real insight from an angle of what you are doing on genetic of, uh, of uh, Alzheimer, but also with the Down syndrome. I will let Ahlam after this speak up more about the Down syndrome. But I wanted just to give you uh, what was asked from my part, what is going on in Tunisia just in a few minutes. We have a, a cohort of more than 6,000 Alzheimer's patients among them, uh, more than 3,000 have been gener uh, ha We have samples of DNA from more than 3,000 of them. What, what you have said, Joe, about this is very important. We began our studies saying that we have among these patients a huge cohort of early onset dementia, early onset Alzheimer's. That's what we discussed with people on epidemiology and genetic epidemiology. And they say that is this, and one of them is a prince from England and the people of WHO had a meeting on this. They said that this is just a center effect. When you have a center, you will have people with earlier onset. They said me, when your, when your size of your sample will grow, the, size, the number of early onset will be less. And what, this was not the case. Still in 6,000 patients, we have one, uh, 1,500, which is 24 persons who are early onset dementia. And this is not at all as what is found in other studies. More than this, we have made, uh, we were astonished by this and we have gone on seeing what the pattern, genet the genetic epidemiology pattern. And Joe, you know that in North Africa, homozygosity and you know that inbreeding is very, very important, especially for the old population. They, the majority is coming from an inbreeding of their parents which are first degree cousins, which was very privileged in our population. And guess what? More than 40 families were with, with a decisive recessive pattern, which was not the case in the other studies published by the Italian, by the Japanese and other uh, population. There are a few number of recessive patterns. My feeling, and it's not a scientific one, it's just what I'm seeing on the ground, is that the recessive pattern is involved in our country. You have also spoke about what's going on the APOE presentation. What I can say to you is that the APOE presentation, APOE epsilon 4 in our population is linked to, the, to a better, I will say, MMSC score when it is on late onset. But whatever it is on early onset or late onset, they will lose the cognitive function more rapidly than the non carrier of the upper epsilon E4, which is something that we have Akram with us, we have Ali Garbi also on the panel with Amina, and they can give you more precision if you want more detail like this. We carry it, the upper And I, 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 forgot to say you that when you compare recessive pattern to the dominant one or the sporadic one, you have differences on the clinical presentation, slight, but statistically significant difference. That was, I will say, the background of our families. We have studied the pre mutation and my colleagues can give you the results. It was not important in our population. I think that we have only one family with a novel uh, mutations that have been described with the team of Shadikol we worked with. Uh, the, the, the lab uh, 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 professors that are with me can, can correct me. 
That's the graph. We have this cohort of patients. This, uh, these patients are all with a definite diagnosis because all have neuro, uh, neurology examination, MRI or, or uh, T, uh, uh, scanner examination, and all have neuropsychological testing. That means it's a homogeneous cohort with definite results. And we cannot explain on the bedside some of these differences that must be a genetic uh, background, not only environment one one uh, for Alzheimer's. I just uh, gave you a glimpse for what we have on the ground here. And uh, we are far, far from your uh, lab research, but we are trying also to do at, at Arvin what is possible on the ground. Uh, I, I, I had just a few comments. Uh, I, I did not mention it uh, strongly, but the, the, our PS1 G206A in Puerto Rico, and there's a, a inbreeding going on there so that the, the frequency of those mutation is exceptionally high in Puerto Rico. And it's a founder mutation so that it's not seen elsewhere, but in Puerto Rican population. So that we see them in, in Florida because a lot of Puerto Ricans have migrated to so I'm guessing that uh, there will be some uh, founder mutations in, in, in Tunisia. And because of consanguinity, it's gonna be uh, exceptionally high, uh, relatively common, and so that uh, it would be really nice to study those individuals. And the beauty of that is that when you, when I threw out all those omic studies that I uh, talked about, transcriptomics, proteomics, and, and metabolomics, each of those omic experiments are extremely expensive, right? Whole genome sequencing will take, cost $800, and then you add metabolomics, whatever. However, when you have a high frequency of these mutations or variants in, in consanguineous families, then we can achieve the same uh, power using smaller number of uh, uh, families, rather than uh, collecting, you know, hundred thousand uh, uh, randomly selected people, because uh, obviously you see the the segregating pattern of the the genes and the traits. So I think it's exceptionally powerful, and at the same time, it's economical. So which is, you know, a nice uh, thing to have when you are trying to convince the funding agency and the reviewer that. Yes, this is something we want to do. So I, I'm very curious. Uh, I, I would love to see your pedigree because you pointed out that you clearly see autosomal recessive pattern, and and as expected, you know that will be powerful uh, things to look at. And and I think I uh, talked about uh, uh, recessive and then long run homozygosity in some of these families that we looked at. And I think it would be all cool to do. Uh, and, and because, you know, you're gonna be uh, looking at, at the consanguineous families, it will be the num number of different PS1 mutation won't be 300, it will be very few. So therefore, the, the comparison across different population may not be as difficult as you expect to see in the US or elsewhere. So I think in all cases, and then if you have already those clinical data uh, measured, and then I would like to ask like, for, for your uh, medical record, do you usually routinely keep pedigree on those individuals who have early onset or, or late onset or whatever uh, the case may be? Do you, do you keep the pedigree? Do you, do you keep uh, in your medical record, do you have a family history of pedigree showing who in your family are affected with uh, Alzheimer's? When there is more than one case, you have a mandatory a pedigree that is made to see how things are going and if there are other cases. You know, in Tunisia, we had the experience which is very important of the last two mutation in Parkinson. Last two mutation in Parkinson in Europe is one or two person. In Tunisia, Algiers or Morocco, it's 
33%, uh, it's one third of the population. So we know that we need, for cases that seem sporadic, to be very, very careful on the pedigree because we are sure that in Alzheimer's disease also, there are founder mutations that we have seen on, and uh, we don't want to afraid the population, but the, 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 the rate of familial cases in our series is important, but we don't want to make it afraid because everyone who comes to the consultation will say, is it genetic? Do they have it? So we are very careful on discussing this until we have the genetic results. I hope I answered your comment. Yeah, no, I, I used to uh, work on Parkinson's disease about seven, eight years ago. So I know a little bit about Parkinson's disease myself. So, uh, you know, uh, is it LARC2 or something? That's not important. Yeah. But anyway, yes, uh, it's fantastic that you have pedigree information. Uh, and it would be, uh, I, I would love to visit uh, Tunisia and chat with you uh, if I can. Oh, pleasure. Uh, and and I think this would be a fantastic way to start a, uh, a collaborative effort, if possible. I it was my pleasure. I, I I wonder if someone from the uh, Tunisia, from the Tunisian team, uh, Dr. Ali Garbi, Dr. Nasri, or Ikram, who are there, have any comment to add? If I have forgot something on on the things that we have on the ground. I don't think you said it all, the Professor Greed. Um, just to specify that uh, in uh, 2021, we have already uh, 97 families with the recessive pattern uh, for 80 uh, families. Uh, and um, uh, we, of course, have the pedigrees of all, uh, of all those uh, families and the sporadic forms. Uh, <coughs> The other forms as well, the dominant and the, even the sporadic uh, families. We have the, the pedigrees for all these. Uh, for uh, one uh, other comment, uh, uh, we uh, didn't find in uh, the families that we studied uh, for the early onset AD uh, any cases with the presenilin 1, 2, or APP mutations in our, uh, in our families, in our cohort. So uh, we think this uh, would be interesting uh, to, to so, discuss and go. Uh, so if I may uh, add. Uh, I, mean, yes. uh, I think that there, there's a publication from Charles Nicole. We are co-authoring this publication that has one person in limitation. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that Ekram has seen this paper. No, yes, no, the no, novel person in. Uh, yeah, I, if I may add. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that you don't have any PS1, PS2, and APP mutation carriers because among our only onset, 95% of the people do not have these three forms of mutation, uh, mutations in three genes. So this gives you an opportunity to look at other genes that may be contributing to early onset. So it's an opportunity that other people in the Western countries have not had a chance to examine because uh, Western countries, uh, it's difficult to find large pedigrees and, and constant awareness pedigrees. So, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, I, I think it'd be a, a nice thing to, to look at your, your uh, families uh, and, and try to investigate further. All right, I have one question just um, I'm not an Alzheimer's expert, uh, but um, when you mentioned that you see less early onset, or you see more early onset than you expected, how much of that has to do with just the age structure of the population? I mean, do you have, I mean, do you have like a different, you know, amount of very old people? I mean. Joseph, the question is for me. Yes. Okay, I'll I, I, I say this to you. At the difference of the other countries in Africa, on Sub-Saharan Africa, the Tunisian population is the only one in Africa who has been more than 30 years of median of age. That's one thing. The second right. thing is that the pyramid of age has changed. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, now this early onset is really something which is uh, uh, a problem for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we have people that have 65, less than 65. That's the definition of early onset. Mm -hmm. But 
we have even aged more uh, earlier than they, which means that we have people that mandatory have some genetic clue on this. These mm -hmm. people have been studied and studied extensively in the department with the follow-up and with the genetic uh, sampling on it. What is mm -hmm. difficult for us is to make lumbar puncture for uh, the patients which are less well tolerated by the population. Mm -hmm. This this uh, this group of early onset is not really uh, all of this related to the pyramid of age. Mm -hmm. There's an effect of or also of uh, the uh, the population beginning uh, at, this, at this time really on early onset. I think mm -hmm. that uh, Alia, which is there, uh, can you, Alia, precise for some patient, what is the earlier age that you have found? Uh, sorry, maybe she's, she needs to be granted access as a panelist. Mm -hmm. No, no, she's with she's Amira. With us. She's with she's us. She's with, with the Amira office. If she's unconscious. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, so uh, you have you have the mean age of uh, early onset, uh, uh, Alia. The mean age of uh, of our, our early onset patient are um, six um, fifty six, uh, but I think we have patient uh, from uh, uh, fifty or forty uh, to uh, to. Six. So uh, this is what I wanted to answer you. That, that's that real time of early onset, which is really, uh, it's give me, I'm working on Alzheimer more than 20 years now. I'm really panicking about this. At the beginning, I thought it was only uh, bias of uh, being the specialist group about this. Now I'm sure there's a background and I'm quite sure it's a genetic background. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, so to me, to me, what seems the most interesting there, though, is that what I was getting at was the question of you said early onset's just defined at 65, but perhaps maybe you should define it lower to get a more pure early onset. I mean, is there familial clustering or so forth in these age of onsets and stuff? Because, I mean, you will be getting by chance some, you know, younger some of the people with it if there's a difference in etiology with late and they just may be that you're seeing more of the early ones than those i, I okay. just wonder i i also give you a, a, a primary reflection on this we have a sample i said you know uh, the exact number on the database is six thousand eight hundred, i think but some mm -hmm. of them have not all the data roughly six thousand patients on the database you, you can't invent a database on a country like this so yeah. I can speak about what you are doing on uh, one of the things that you have to see, if you see the publication on early onset, mm -hmm. the, uh, on the centers there are 200, 300. We have 1,500. And mm -hmm. still, I, I'm begging Alia to publish the paper. That's one. The second <laughs> one, <laughs> the second <laughs> one, is, <laughs> because it's easy to work on the database. It's more difficult to to make it uh, published as a paper. Uh, the second uh, remark I have I have to give on this is that for these patients who are on, on, on the early onset, we are now working, and I can say it, but we can discuss the, the details scientific on another time. We are now comparing the very early onset to the very late onset in our population. We have, there's a work going on because we want to see what really is different between this very, very, very early onset dementia to the late onset dementia. Mm -hmm. And that's the work that Alia is asked to do now from months. And I think that the results will come soon on this. Great. <laughs> so if I may add, uh, I think to Tovilivir's point on, on the fact that uh, life expectancy in Tunisia is low, therefore that when you say a large proportion of 80 cases are early onset. I think, you know, that's a valid point uh, because if you die before 75, you cannot contribute your late onset cases to that for, for whatever reason. So the proportion may be a little bit exaggerated compared to the Western population. However, if the person comes into uh, your clinic and then, and then the person is having all the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, you don't care 
uh, what portion of the population that is, because you have a case uh, of AD that are early onset. And, and as I pointed out in my, one of my figures, people with a PS1 mutation, some people live to 80 years old within the same family where somebody in the family may have onset at 40, but some people live to 80 without uh, memory impairments. So those people may be a really of interest to, to look further because you know, there may be a really strong modifier that uh, protects against uh, those and whatever, even though they may not have a PS1, but you may have some other uh, genetic variant that may be causing Alzheimer's in these families, which as I said, since 95% are not derived from PS1, PS2, APP, you may have a second, uh, a fourth mutation uh, that may be causative in Tunisia, which is something worthwhile investigating. So, but you know, when whenever you see a variability, um, I, I I always think about are there genetic modifiers even in these uh, what appears to be uh, autosomal dominant form of Alzheimer's disease. So I, I think this is really cool. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. You have a remark. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for your feedback. I I do understand why you talk about scary figures in Tunisia. And we have noticed that in southern Tunisia, for example, uh, we have co-occurrence uh, of uh, dementia together with other genetic diseases within the same pedigree. It's not the same person who has the disease, but uh, for example, in southern Tunisia, we have some families with xeroderma pigmentosa, as it is, uh, it's the XPC form, so it's particularly severe um, disease of the skin. These are people who are unable uh, to repair their DNA once they are exposed to the sun. And in those pedigrees, when we ask the families, sometimes they talk about dementia for people having 40 years. They are 40 at, at early in their 40 years. And what happens is that they're so much stigmatized by having other very severe diseases so that they know that there is nothing to do for them. So they don't, they are not even referred to hospitals. They we don't go to, 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 to have a diagnosis. I wanted to ask you, Professor Guider, about co-occurrence. In your experience, uh, have you seen dual diagnosis pedigrees when you have the familial history? Do you have other genetic diseases? And I would like to, um, uh, Dr. Ahlem Ashur, uh, in the families with Down syndrome, in as they document the familial history, do you have other types of diseases? Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Sonia, the co-occurrence of diseases is something which is very, very uh, problematic for us. I will give you, for example, we began an immense custom department that you know very well is uh, someone which is working a lot on ILS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. At the beginning, we were very astonished, but the continuum between uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and uh, frontal temporal dementia, which is a kind of dementia, but uh, uh, linked to some mutation C9 or we found it, and we found even that in our population, the evolution of ILS is less, uh, it take, takes more time, and this is something, work that we are doing with our Italian colleague to understand what's going on. We have evolution involved disease, which is a type of progressive myoclonic epilepsy, which is fine, especially in the North African countries and in the Baltic region. It needs inbreeding and a founder mutation. We have it. And these people can develop mild dementia occurring at an age which is precocious. So you can have occurrence of diseases which are uh, due to either the disease itself or the inbreeding or that we have in our families. So yes, the response, response from our part is definitely yes. Ahlan, I let you speak about the Down syndrome. Uh, hello, thank you. So um, I'm working in the reference center of uh, Down syndrome. So in Tunisia, um, we see 
around the 1,500 1, patients per year. Uh, of course, we see some patient, patients uh, two times a year, but around 30 patients per week uh, with Down syndrome. As uh, Professor Lee said, um, the, most ma the vast majority of our patients are not older than 40 years old. So now we didn't detect up to date any patient with uh, Alzheimer's uh, signs, clinical signs. Uh, and I think this is because um, our patients didn't continue to come to the follow-up. Uh, of course, maybe for socioeconomical reasons. Uh, but uh, I think it is very important to, to study this population uh, for down syndrome population, but also for uh, the the other populations with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, yeah, uh, and of course with the the improvement also of the management of Down syndromes. Now we are see we see that the patients became older and older also in Tunisia. Uh, so that's it. So we have a very huge population of Down syndrome uh, in Tunisia, and we see a lot of patients in our department. Uh, so we are open to collaborations. And I, I have another question to Professor Guider. As from your database, do you see, uh, do you have patients with Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome? I can answer by my practice, no, but uh, the Alia Herbie, who is uh, the angel guard of the database can give us uh, uh, information if there is. Uh, uh, Ali, I don't, I don't recall uh, an association. Do you have uh, patients in your database? Um, no, we don't. We don't have uh, any patient with Down syndrome. But, so but we... Ahlam, I, I will take the advice of Joe. You should keep contact with Ali and make something longitudinal on the uh, neuropsychological uh, exploration of patients we can offer you the neuropsychological testing, the neurophysiological uh, exploration. You can do it with uh, Alia. Alia, don't come to my department, to my office saying, the, I want to do this uh, work. You can do it from now. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Can I just comment on that? Uh, sorry for joining late. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank the speakers. I, uh, I guess that it was very good uh, presentations. Uh, my question, and I'm, I want to come back to the early onset uh, question. And <clears throat> uh, from my experience on cancer, I think that we have the same issue for breast cancer patients. So we have around, or even more than 15% of breast cancer patients that are under 35 years old, which is really, um, uh, a lot, and um, uh, by discussing with different other colleagues, uh, it looks like it's the same thing in different other uh, conditions, disorders, and diseases. So my question is about, is it really genetics or is it uh, caused by environmental factors like the stressful lifestyle that we have here in Tunisia and in the region, or maybe both of them? And uh, the question is, um, is there any studies that um, have been performed in Tunisia and the interaction between environment and genetics? <clears throat> okay, I can answer you this. You know, uh, quantifying all these, uh, I will say, neuropsychological aspects that are in our office is not easy. You have to have some events to understand it. I will give you an example. There was a war on Lebanon. They were able to see that with this war, multiple sclerosis relapses were more frequent. You have to have a very defined event to make it. If not, you know it will be very difficult. What it is, I will say uh, more obvious, that we replicate what we have seen in Parkinson's disease, another disease. We have specific diseases, and we have when we have gone to to uh, the genome of our patients, we have found specific mutations that account, uh, uh, you know, sir, we, everyone says that we are from Arab ancestry. I don't think so. In Saudi Arabia, back uh, like two mutations <laughs> is 2% only. We are 33%, so it may be something different. Uh, yes. So that's something which is important to, to, to see. There must be, uh, 
a genetic background. You can say to me why this have not been explored till now for several reasons. One of them is that we want to make a clear cut on this and to be sure about what we are doing. When you make work on 10 patients, it's not the same thing than now uh, structuring a work on thousands of patients. It doesn't have the same impact and the same conclusions. And if you want to see also if there is some aggravating factors or uh, factors that are intrinsic in genetics, which I wish, uh, if you have cohort, you can do it. You can't do it with a sample of one family or two. That was the, the uh, idea about, uh, the, I will say, the, the delay of this work. But now I think that we don't have any reason to delay it. The work is there. The people working on the lab on genetics are there. And there are even pastor trained people there. So we can do the work now. <laughs> yes, I, I, thank you. I also I also wonder if like uh, these things happening in the region, the one big difference as you keep talking saying is the consanguinity. So you may be able to see more homozygous effects that you don't see so much in Europe or other populations that have been studied. Like why shouldn't there be knockouts or, or things like that that have very small effects on complex traits that can have a big effect on you know what you see there so i mean that's something you can look at that you can't really do in europe is look at you know look at these homozygous effects when you have gwas type data you know. very good Ahlem, there's a remark for you uh, and for uh, sonia saying that uh, it's from riza Murad, our uh, eminent prof on uh, uh, genetics saying regarding the concurrence we have different patients with Down syndrome and Moya Moya syndrome. Ah, uh, yes, the answer, the, to answer to uh, Dr. Abdul Haq. Thank you so much. I, uh, maybe <laughs> Ahlem, you could you could answer because we have some families with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, it's um, just fortuitous uh, co-occurrence of Moya 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 and other genetic diseases. So uh, anyway, I think. Really, I would like to thank all of you because we have had such inspiring um, lectures and also discussions. And to go further with the collaboration, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to make um, a, a workshop maybe on trying to identify, you know, what is fantastic for us today is that um, there, there, is, there are great advances in the technology. As said before uh, by Professor Lee, it doesn't cost that much today to make some genetic investigation. So instead of going in GWASs, we could maybe go directly to genome, uh, genomes of key persons in the pedigrees. And uh, then um, with the help of experts as you, uh, maybe we could make some uh, studies about um, uh, the power uh, uh, of uh, how many people we need to sequence or how many people we need to uh, analyze in order to reach uh, very interesting um, results. Uh, what would be fantastic would be not only to identify genes involved in Alzheimer's well, and other neurodegenerative, but also to identify maybe modifiers uh, that explain why some people who are carriers of uh, genetic mutations and do not express it. So I'm sure that by combining all the expertises and it would be really uh, paving the way for new discoveries. So I don't know if there are other questions, otherwise maybe we could uh, stop here. What do you think? Let me, just, let, let, just, let me thank Joe again. Uh, really, you let us dream. I, what your presentation was simply fantastic. I wanted to thank you again. That's it. Sorry, uh, Sonia. I just like to add like... one one point. I just like to add one point. If you have a consequence to large families, and as Sonia uh, pointed out, that there are some comorbid conditions that are occurring, so that if you have a detailed pedigree, large pedigree with the database on a, a collection of uh, various health outcomes. In, in a large database, you can essentially look at one disease and comorbid conditions 
and and you can do this very economically. Uh, so I think it's important you have a very detailed, uh, uh, meticulous database, and then that will start everything. And then you know there are very smart people uh, on this panel and others uh, around, and then they'll you know come up with ideas that you never even thought of, uh, and then we can explore. Uh, and I think that's the way to go. Uh, because nobody has a uh, monopoly on the innovation or ideas. So I think this is a good opportunity to get uh, things rolling. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Joey, All right. the last word or Yosef. Thank you so much. Really, as said, Professor Guido, you made us dream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Thank I you very much. Say, I think, Joe, Joe, anything to add? No, I was just going to say I look forward to the chance to continue these sort of conversations in person at some point. You know, we started uh, two, three years ago now. I was in Tunisia trying to start something, and then COVID ruined everything for a while. We made good use of the uh, opportunity to do these Zoom meetings and get to know each other, but it's obviously would be more fun to get together and brainstorm in person at some point later in the year or something, now that things are getting back to normal. So I look forward to that opportunity. So Thank who's so speaking next? Who's going to be speaking next session? Uh, we'll have a speaker from Tunisia, I guess. Um, so we have a postdoc from the lab of uh, Professor Ahmed Ribeye, or otherwise uh, himself, he also promised to contribute. So um, we keep you informed about that. Great. On March 1st. And I hope that we will be able to, to see you in Tunisia. Maybe we could start planning for your trip here. Okay. <laughs> again, yeah, I, I really want to thank again, Professor Guider and uh, Professor Joy for, for having uh, really made such a great presentation. And, um, you know, he has completely changed the ecosystem of neurology in Tunisia. So I'm sure that um, by collaborating together, we'll continue with the same pace. Thank you also, Dr. Nasri and um, uh, Dr. Ashur and all those who are here, uh, participants, and hope to see you soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Very much. Bye. 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 B